What's up, everybody? How we doing? It's another beautiful Sunday session. I think we're on episode, what, 35 right now? So we've been pumping these Sunday sessions out. Uh, and I love it. It's one of my favorite days of the week. I got a few favorite days of the week. I think every day is my favorite day of the week. You know, it's just how my mind works. Super positive. I spent a lot of years being super negative, got me absolutely nowhere in life. So now I switched it up, completely different spectrum. And life's good, life's beautiful, nothing to complain about. Well, I'm sure there is, it's just nobody wants to hear it anyway. So keep grinding it out. Welcome everybody. Diego, hello, Zycom, what's up? Chaps, how you doing? Brandon, Brandon, what's up? Shashi. back to it uh how many employees do you need for an operation your size uh between 30 and 50 you know definitely for my size i would say 50 because that's how many i have is it really hard to find distributors should i just buy products from alibaba to get higher margin profit no uh so what i teach is amazon wholesale we're not buying anything from alibaba we're not buying anything from 1688 we're not buying anything from overseas at all we're buying it all right here in the united states and the reason why is because they're brand name products that i do not have to advertise for and i can get them into amazon in a couple days maybe two or three weeks max so we're not using amazon at all so Zoom Lynn just said she's going to leverage other businesses in her area to use their warehouse as a shipping address to get, open up more wholesale accounts. That is a genius idea, Zoom Lynn, right? I know a few people are doing that right now. They do not have the funds to get their first warehouse. They do not have the space at their current location to open up certain wholesale accounts that will only ship to commercial residents or commercial business addresses. So what they're doing is they're going into local mom and pop stores who have a warehouse and a loading dock. And they're saying, hey, you know, I'd love to whatever, pay you a couple hundred dollars per shipment if I could use your delivery gate as an opportunity for me to build your business. And you'll be very surprised how many people are willing to assist with that because a lot of these people, they know what it takes to start a business off early on. So I think dropshipping is dead, honestly, on Amazon at least. Listen, there's still some opportunity with Shopify and you know, creating some viral videos on TikTok and doing shop uh, drop shipping. But I've been saying this for 18 months now. Amazon drop shipping is dying. It's been dying and it's practically dead. The amount of uh, accounts that have, people have reached out to us in the past couple of months for Section 3 drop shipping, it's astounding. I'm talking almost 100 sellers or 100 storefronts, right? Because some of the sellers own multiple storefronts, but they're getting flagged for Section 3 drop shipping. And it's killing their business. So I see a lot of people asking about distributors, right? And A, I'm not going to give distributors on this live because that means you're too reliant on me. Let's say I give you a distributor and you're able to make some money on it, right? But you don't understand how to find them yourself. You don't understand how to do proper keyword research. You don't understand how to leverage LinkedIn searches. You don't understand how to leverage monster searches for these jobs. You don't understand how to navigate trade shows, right? If I give you a supplier and then something happens with that supplier and you need another supplier, you're just going to come crawling back to me, begging you to give you another supplier, right? And that's not sufficient. That doesn't help you do anything. That just makes you so self-reliant on me to help you grow your business that you can never be self-sufficient long-term. So that is not something I will ever do. I will never sell a list of vendors. I will never sell a list of suppliers. It's the same reason I don't believe in FBA leads list for retail arbitrage. It creates too much competition. And you sell someone a dream telling them, hey, you're going to make $5 an item and you could buy this at Walmart and get 10 of them and make 50 bucks. And if you do that 10 times, you can make $500 a week, right? You sell someone this dream and then they buy the leads list. And before you know it, there's 40, 50 sellers on the listing because they oversold their leads list. Now there's too much competition. Um, how do you optimize shipping costs for oversized products when they split your shipment? So, uh, so what we do is we will, if we get a multi-split to multiple warehouses, we'll actually not confirm that that shipment is being finalized and we'll wait for another day. We'll also make some adjustments to the quantities that we're shipping. And sometimes you can kind of, I don't want to say manipulate, that's the incorrect word, uh, but you could play with the numbers where you can get suggested FC locations that are different every time, right? So let's say I'm sending three uh, oversized products out. 
um, and I got 20 units of each, what I might do is I might put 30 units of each, right? And see if I can get them all sent to that one facility and then I'll make the, the number change to reflect what I'm actually sending, right? So let's just say 25 because it's five units or, or six units or less you can change. Um, so let's just say I'll make them all 26 and then I'll put them in and then I'll adjust them to 20 after the fact. And also I make sure that the, that the uh, oversized products that I'm purchasing, that they have substantial enough profit to cover the cost of shipping. Right now, our average oversized product costs about $2 to send to Amazon, right? So our minimum buying requirement for standard size is about $2. So I couldn't have the same minimum buying requirement for oversized because $2 is just too low. It would all be eaten up in my cost of oversized shipping. So for our oversized products, we have a higher a gross profit prerequisite of about $5, right? And even higher than that is better because then that $5, it covers the $2 in shipping and allows for a $3 profit. Leads lists have been creating a huge problem with arbitrage listings in the last year. So arbitrage has become really popular and much more saturated than it was prior. Absolutely. And that's another reason why I love wholesale because the people who are getting the wholesale are looking to scale this thing out long term. Right, the people are getting an RA, they're just trying to make a quick couple bucks. You know, so what what I like doing, selling with other people or about building long-term sustainable businesses like wholesale sellers, is that they understand more of what they're doing. Um, they understand how Amazon works, which makes it a more uh, reasonable playing field for all of the sellers on those listings, opposed to retail arbitrage, where if you get a hot selling SKU and all of a sudden you got 70 sellers on it. The demand is there, but also the supply is too much. So what happens when the demand is there and the supply is too much? The price drops. It's basic economics. Uh, so on gating and beauty and personal care, you'd find an invoice that you're or you'd find a product that you're gated in. And then you would click uh, the approval button to see what needs to be submitted to get approved to sell in that category. And it most likely will ask you for an invoice with at least 10 items on it. And then you would use those 10 items to purchase those products, submit the invoice to Amazon, and then they would either approve or deny, preferably approve your request. I was doing a lot of arbitrage a few months ago and I've transitioned to 90% wholesale because the listings just do, do not price tank or saturate like our arbitrage listings do. Absolutely, Jay. What do you do when you start getting threatening letters from Borghi? So usually we ignore them full transparency, depending on how serious it gets, but we ignore the first at least one or two, you know, and then based on what they start sending, then we make a decision either to stop selling the inventory or reach out to the complainant and come to an amicable solution, especially if we spent a lot of money on it, right? If I spent a lot of money on a product and a brand's telling me, hey, you can't sell this product on Amazon anymore, it's like, okay, buy it back for me, you know, buy it back. If you don't want me to sell it on Amazon, buy it back. If you're not going to buy it back, I'm going to sell through my inventory. So Wizards of FBA just asked, he found a prep center with $1.20 a unit, including bundles. Yeah, that's good. $1.20 a unit. Um, so to Abdullah, we do not pay GST. GST is a goods and service tax based on VAT, right? So because we're not selling in the European market, or well, we do sell there, and that's something that's very small. So it's like almost not included in my calculations when I'm figuring out our tax payments. Um, but we don't pay because we're not selling in those marketplaces. Um, we don't have GST VAT taxes. So uh, we hire a CPA to take care of our taxes because she knows what to do. Uh, what do we do with returned items, Jana? Great question. So uh, we do a few things. We make a decision if we could send it back to Amazon. If we could send it back to Amazon, we relabel it with either a different FN SKU or leave the same FN SKU and we send it back to Amazon. Or we send it under a different listing and create a completely new product SKU under that new ASIN and we ship it out under, let's say, a three-pack or a four-pack. If there are no other listings or slightly damaged, we make a decision and it goes to either one of three locations. It either gets donated, it either gets given to an employee. We have like a, a section of our warehouse where we just put stuff where at the end of the day, our employee can go grab it, right? It helps build morale, trust, it helps them get free stuff, which is cool. Everybody likes free stuff. Or we sell it at the flea market. 
Um, is it still a good time to get product to capitalize on Q4? And are toys the only recommended product to take advantage of? Absolutely not. So in Q4, everything picks up. All categories pick up in Q4. Maybe we sell a ton of grocery, ton of health and beauty products because people buy those products year round, right? And they got a little more money to spend in the holiday season. So they're buying more of it. Um, so it's not too late. I know the last day, I believe, to get inventory. I just posted this the other day in our live call. The last day to have inventory guaranteed to be available for sale for Christmas is December 1st. And I believe the last day to have inventory received at Amazon. So it's available for sale on Black Friday and Cyber Monday is like November 12th. So yesterday. Um, but right now is a great time to, you know, list some products FBM. Um, what do you do to return items which have missing pieces in your product? So if I believe the missing pieces was due to an Amazon shipping error, I will take pro pictures of it along with the packing slip that Amazon sent with the item, and I'll submit it to Amazon for a reimbursement, right? Because it was their job to get this product back to me in one piece. If they did not deliver on that job, then I want a refund for that. Uh, do you use any kind of ASIN scraper? It's very hard to check all the lists. Yeah, uh, Scan Unlimited is one I suggest. Uh, what's the other one called? I believe Tactical Arbitra Arbitrage. So what they do, but here's the thing, right? That's not an end-all be-all solution, my friends. You, you can't just rely on the results that a UPC scraper delivers you because if you do, you're going to miss out on tons of opportunity. You have to think outside the box and do title searches. Um, and keyword searches to find those listings that other people aren't finding. You have to. Uh, inventory accounting, there's nothing I'm comfortable recommending that's on the market. They're all trash, to be completely transparent with you. I've tried them all. Skew Vault, Listing Mirror, uh, they're all terrible for inventory tracking within your fulfillment center or your warehouse. You're better off creating a Google Sheet and scanning it into a location. Um, definitely for trade shows, you definitely want to be at ASD, which is happening February 26th to the 1st of March in Las Vegas. You definitely, definitely want to be there 100% without a doubt. Um, which methods do you use to manually source through wholesale catalogs? How do you ensure you've turned over every leaf? So we don't ensure we've turned over every leaf, right? Some of these wholesale catalogs have 50, 60,000 plus line items. It's very challenging to turn over every leaf. Uh, but what I like to do is sort by brand name and then use my knowledge of the industry to look for some of those top selling SKUs. And also if I see a brand name that I don't recognize and I happen to see that there's a great selling one pack, I'll do further research and see, okay, if there's a great selling one pack, Maybe there's a great selling two pack, three pack, six pack, variety pack, 12 pack, 24 pack. There's probably additional opportunities out there. Well, is online arbitrage worth to do or should we focus on wholesale? Depends on how much money you got. If you only got a couple hundred bucks, then online arbitrage is the way to go. Um, but if you got more, I suggest getting to wholesale. But here's also the thing I'd like to say. If right now OA or RA are what's driving revenue to your business, you should be focusing 70% of your time on that and the other 30% on learning wholesale. And then you can make a smooth transition from RA and OA to wholesale because you're not cutting off your source of income. If your source of income right now is um, retail arbitrage and online arbitrage, keep that source of income flowing in, keep it rolling in, keep that bankroll steady, right? While you learn a new framework like wholesale. All right, my friends, this has been amazing. It's been a pleasure spending the past, I don't know, hour with you. I'm here usually every Sunday doing Sunday sessions. This is episode 35. Um, keep in mind, ASD is right around the corner. If you're in the Amazon space, ASD is the event to attend. You're going to be surrounded with thousands of other Amazon sellers. We host a huge event out there with hundreds of Amazon sellers. Uh, we provide you the insights and the, the tips and the tricks and the knowledge necessary to allow you to scale your business to the next level. Plus, you get to walk a show floor at ASD and meet literally thousands of distributors from all over the world, right? So if you're just getting into the space or you've been in the game for a little while and you're wondering, where do I go to build the relationships? Where do I go to get more information? Where do I go to find new wholesalers to open accounts with? The answer is ASD. And it's happening February 26th to March 1st. I'm not affiliated with ASD. They don't pay me to say that. I just have gotten so much value from attending trade shows like ASD that I have to suggest it to everybody. If I wasn't suggesting, I'd be doing you all a massive disservice, right? So I appreciate all your time. Have a beautiful weekend. Stay grateful and stay lit.
adios, my friends.